I'm with my older sister and older brother. We've wandered into the woods to a familiar spot near the west branch of the Black River in Ohio. As we wandered about, my attention was drawn downward as I became intrigued by the various animal prints I found along the muddy banks. As I continue to look for more animal tracks, I find other curiosities. I continue to aimlessly look about, lost in curiosity, gathering the shells of freshwater mussels. At a moment of awareness, I looked up and realized my siblings were not in sight. A brief moment of panic flooded my being, and the word lost played in my mind. The feeling quickly passed, though, when I realized I knew where I was because of the position of the river. And soon after that thought, my brother and sister emerged from the trees nearby, without a second thought of my ever being lost. That account took place when I was eight years old. These curiosities have followed me into adulthood and have led to what I do today. As a naturalist, I do wander quite often. And thankfully, I have never really truly been lost. But sometimes, those who wonder are truly lost. My name is Soraya, and you are listening to Wild Roots. John Huth is the Donner Professor of Science at Harvard University. With his work focused mainly in the field of experimental particle physics, we speak with John Huth not about the Higgs boson and bottom quarks, but about primitive navigation. Huth shares with us a startling experience that led to his obsession with natural navigation and to the book the lost art of finding our way. Huth also teaches a course called Primitive Navigation. Huth explores what we lose as technology substitutes our innate capacity to navigate. Join us today as we rediscover the lost art of finding our own way. Could you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and how you came to explore natural navigation? Okay, uh, well, um, I'm John Huth, and um, let's see, I was, um, I am a uh, professor of physics at Harvard, actually technically I'm the Donner Professor of Science, is the tech, is the uh, name, it's an endowed chair. And um, my work, uh, research work, normally is targeting um, experimental particle physics. So um, in particular right now, I have an experiment um, that's located in Geneva, Switzerland at the Large Hadron Collider. It's called Atlas. And uh, it's been in the news recently for, well, we discovered this particle called the Higgs boson and um, sometimes referred to as the God particle. And um, also more recently, um, I've been exploring a... um, a decay mode of the Higgs, which is actually quite important, uh, where it decays to a pair of um, bottom quarks, um, all sort of um, matter that feels the strong interactions are made out of quarks. And um, so this decay turns out to be rather important and was thought to be impossible to see. But uh, I worked with some theorists and we developed uh, ways of um, seeing this decay mode. And so I guess a little, little less than a year ago, we, we saw that. So um, 
so that's kind of my research side of things. I teach at Harvard, and I recently finished teaching a course called Wave Phenomena, which is fun. Um, the navigation angle, it came up um, really through um, a rather tragic accident that I was in close proximity to. Um, I, um, in 2003, I was sea kayaking off the coast of Maine and um, didn't uh, it was one of these cases where I didn't even know enough that I was putting myself at risk. Um, but um, fog uh, rolled in, and um, I realized that since I didn't have a compass with me, I'd have to do something um, to find my bearings. And so I paid attention to the direction the wind was blowing, and I saw that there was a large swell coming um, from the Atlantic into the Gulf of Maine, and I could hear waves crashing on a large beach. And I knew that if I could use these to maintain my bearings, that if I paddled for about 20 minutes, I'd come to um, some shallows where waves crashed. And I made my way around the island with enough problems. Um, so that wasn't the, the real uh, issue. Then um, three months later, Columbus Day weekend, I was at Cape Cod. And um, Again, I had a recreational kayak, and I went out, and at the time I noticed the wind direction when I went out. It was a clear, clear, warm day, but the water temperature was quite cold, and I had a wetsuit on and then. And um, oh, within 30 minutes, a large uh, fog bank rolled in again. And uh, again, I'd, using the wind as kind of a natural direction indicator and kind of knowing where I was, and there were other things that allowed me to figure out directions, um, including a, the sound of a buoy out to sea. And um, it was actually rather pleasant and enjoyable. I mean, I, I was out of sight of land several times, but I was able to turn north and hit the uh, coastline. The next um, day I was out paddling and the harbor master uh, was in a boat and caught up with me. And uh, he asked me if I'd seen two young women uh, kayaking, and I later learned that there were two young women who launched their kayaks the exact same time I did, um, about a half a mile down the beach, and um, they were lost, and I didn't know this, but there was a search and rescue mission that was going on all along, and I could see the Coast Guard helicopter going up and down Nantucket Sound at that point. Um, they found the body of one of the young women the next day. I guess that was Monday, which was Columbus Day. And they never did find the body of the other woman. And um, I was really floored. I think, you know, you can read about a oh, well, tragic accident in the newspaper and kind of shrug your shoulders. But I was doing exactly the same thing at exactly the same time in almost exactly the same place. And, and so I had what... I guess could be classified as survivor's guilt um, mm -hmm. and um, became obsessed with it. And um, a lot of times, you know, you ask the question why, and sometimes the universe is not going to cough up the answer why. It's just going to be there. So over time, I became obsessed with um, navigating by natural means. I guess it was sort of like, you know, how can I ward off? <laughs> this evil or something like that. And uh, I, I memorized the positions of major stars in the sky so that I could just look up at the sky at night and orient myself and um, wind patterns and wave patterns. And um, pretty soon, um, I guess after about a year, I was viewing the world quite differently because the, 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 you know, the sun in the sky and the shadows on the ground and even the growth patterns of the trees were all telling me something. And um, I also felt that when I was looking around at other people that they were kind of like zombies because they weren't noticing these things. And you know, not, nothing against them because that would have been me a year ago. But because of the experience, I, I was looking at the world in a different way. And I wanted to... Uh, wanted to, mm -hmm. you know, shake them out of their stupor, which, of course, would not be a good idea. <laughs> yeah, and, definitely. Our technologies have impeded upon these natural tools that we utilized on a regular basis. And so in the book, you uh, describe this bubble. So um, could you tell us what is the bubble? <laughs> 
Well, the bubble, in a sense, is us being kind of bound by not only our technologies, but our inability to see things. One of the things that's interesting is that if you know you can see something, all of a sudden it's visible. Um, but if you don't think that you can see something, uh, you're oblivious to it. And so the bubble is, in my mind, a combination of not knowing what you can see um, combined with this, this kind of sphere of technology that we wrap around ourselves and sort of creates a disconnect um, with our environment. Yeah, so when you study animal behavior, you learn all these different mechanisms used by animals to navigate. You know, some animals use celestial cues tied to their circadian rhythms. Um, some warblers uh, use the stars to orient their southbound travels. Insects such as bees use polarized light and remarkably give actual physical cues to their fellow bees that point into the direction of food sources and it's pretty accurate and it's called the waggle dance which is pretty cool. Uh, I also learned that some animals have what's called a uh, map sense uh, while others have map and compass sense and of course there's animals that rely on magnetism to orient themselves particularly on long migrations. So. Surely humans, too, have some natural mechanisms for navigating and orienteering, right? Well, that's a good question. Um, it's plausible, but I think most of what humans have done is, is to become incredibly good observers just using our existing senses. Mm -hmm. And um, when, you, when you look at this, at first it does seem innate, but then you can break it down. And let me give you an example. Um, um, I've been studying one navigational technique, which is popular in the Marshall Islands in the Central Pacific, called wave piloting. And um, the navigators use the um, the ocean waves and swells and the way they interact with the atolls as um, a means of finding their way. And um, I knew an anthropologist, or I know an anthropologist who studied it, but in a number of cases, he could just not see what the... Um, the navigator was telling him, and uh, and so it seemed like it was a sixth sense in a way. But then when I started to, to look at it and break it down and understand the science of ocean waves, um, it became apparent what he was doing and that he just knew what to look for. So I don't think it's necessarily that there's a sixth sense. It's just that over time, knowing what to look for and mm -hmm. you know getting comfortable with that um, is, is what uh, what we end up doing. And it's a skill that I think can be taught because I, I teach it to students all the time. And, um, you know, I guess one of the more remarkable moments is we have them memorize the positions of major navigational stars in the sky. And, and it seems like rote learning at first, right? Because you're saying, you know, Antares, the declination of 26 degrees, and, um, mm -hmm. oh, I don't, you know, uh, pick another star, Al Deberin is, is at right. 19 or something, blah, blah, blah. And, um, um, and so they, they kind of, at least they, some of them think of it as this kind of, you know, baloney. But then we take them to the roof of the science center and all of a sudden it becomes real and they have to, the quiz to pick out the stars in the sky and orient themselves. And, you know, they'll say, ah, the summer triangle, it's much larger than I thought. And, and, and there really does seem to be a real epiphany. And, in a way, they gain that that sort of intuitive sixth sense of being able to orient themselves with the night sky. So in essence, what we've lost is simply just paying attention to our surroundings and our environment, paying attention to those natural cues that technology disconnects us from. And um, we don't think about the sun's orientation at different times of the year. We don't take into account the wind's direction or study the stars very well. We don't consciously step outside of that bubble where then the world can open up to us. So it's, it's, it's just this, the technologies that we have have always been this double-edged sword because uh, like our memories are poor because we don't remember phone numbers, we don't remember addresses. Um, in this age of information we have incredible knowledge but without computers giving us this information that we seek, modern humans might as well find themselves truly lost, figuratively and literally. So it, it seems as if we've lost our navigational resiliency. I would say actually there's there's even more than 
kind of a metaphorical connection. The, the part of the brain that um, is used for navigation uh, is also used for what's called declarative memory. So um, that is called the hippocampus, which is a Greek word meaning um, seahorse. And that serves in multiple roles. One is having kind of a map of your surroundings in your head. Um, and if I were to ask you to think about, I don't know, the, the, the environment in, you know, near your hometown where you grew up or something like that, you know, you would all of a sudden start to picture what that looks like. Um, and I could say, well, you know, um, I have, there's a problem that I call waking up in a strange hotel in the middle of the night mm -hmm. problem where, you know, you first don't know where you are and you have to kind of think, oh, wait, here I am. And sort of the room spins around and everything falls into place. So that's a cognitive map. But in addition to that, if I were to ask you to picture or give me the name of your favorite high school teacher, you can do that as kind of an act of will. And it turns out that the, those memories are in exactly the same place that gives you the cognitive map. So it's quite plausible that if you degrade one skill, you degrade the other skill. Mm -hmm. I am an avid backpacker, and I've done quite a bit of long distance backpacking. And uh, a few years ago, I spent nearly five and a half months on the Connell Divide. And most of the time you just utilize what's handy and readily available today, which is GPS. But I did carry paper maps and a compass just in case. And before this, before setting out on this uh, journey, I did kind of school myself a little bit on it. And actually I wanted to use it. And I actually came upon an incident when I had to use it because my electronic GPS uh, device was was uh, broken. So I was actually quite happy to be able to take on this challenge. I was I welcomed the challenge and I spent about three days navigating with just uh, paper maps and compass and I did quite well. One thing I noticed because the amount of time I spent uh, in the backcountry doing this I noticed that I can judge distances visually like to a mountain pass or across a valley or or a meadow quite accurately and I noticed that when I spend um, some time out of the backcountry and not doing this for some time I lose that ability a little bit um, but I do see how it's how it can be learned easily because just going back and doing it for a few days and I, I can get it back again so as you know humans are incredibly impatient yes so in your experience how long does it take for your students to learn to navigate both safely and effectively um well i find i find that they can pick it up reasonably well within about three weeks um so i have so so let's just take the the map and compass uh as an example there there are a lot of one of, one of the important things in navigation i find is redundancy um and I can kind of explain and maybe even give you a little trick that um, you might throw into your toolkit um, there. So um, part of it, of course, is trying and, and I don't know how, how who came up with the phrase, but it was something like the expert in something is somebody who's made all the mistakes. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a question of making the mistakes. But um, so let me give you three assignments that four assignments that I give the students. Nice. And okay. how, how that leads up to it. So the first one is, is a baseline. We start out, we have the students start out at a landmark, which turns out to be the John Harvard statue in Harvard Yard. And then they get a, um, in a sense, a directional vector by looking at a corner of a building. And that goes due west. And what they have to do is then walk due west as best they can for what they perceive to be 20 minutes. So you are not allowed to have a timepiece. Uh -huh. You just have to have to use your own internal sense of time passing. And after 20, what you perceive to be 20 minutes, you, um, you know, get out a piece of paper and you, uh, you look at, you know, with an iPhone or a watch or something like that, you look at how much time has evolved. And then you estimate how far west you've traveled um, as the crow flies, which means you have to detour around obstacles and regain due west, for example, and uh, estimate how far that is. And okay. then... Uh, Look around your look at your surroundings and make enough notes that you can go back and, and locate your position um, using a map or Google Maps or something like that. And 
What I, people get really surprised because they tend to overestimate their ability to navigate, and they also they also overestimate how far they've gone. Um, their estimate of time is not that bad, I found. Uh, however, um, so that's kind of a baseline, and a lot of people find it a little rattling because they thought they knew these things, and it seems like such an easy exercise. And how could they be so far off? Um, but that's a good thing. So then, then the next. Um, unit is um, something that you can just remember if you're trying to measure distances. The word mile comes from Latin, um, mille passus, which means a thousand paces. And um, that dates back from the era of Roman legionnaires. So every time, let's say your left foot hits the ground, it's a pace. And it turns out that's pretty good for most people. I mean, you know, some people will have somewhat longer paces and some people will have somewhat shorter paces. But if you're stuck in a pinch and you have to measure distances, then a thousand paces to the mile is, is quite good. Um, we also um, teach them how to measure distances by uh, holding their uh, arm out and extending, say, a finger or multiple fingers. So um, my index finger, when it's extended uh, at the end of my arm, um, it covers about one and a half degrees. And there's a rule of thumb, almost literally, that one degree um, spans 100 feet at a distance of one mile. So you can just do the conversions, and if you know the height of an object in the distance, and you can kind of measure its angular width with your fingers, then you can calculate um, its distance. Um, so that gives you another thing in the toolkit, and you said that you were able to estimate the distance to a distant mountain or something like that, but now you can you know, sort of turn it from just kind of an intuitive sense to something that's a little bit more systematic. Yeah, I really like these tricks because um, I just recently learned from some colleagues of mine out in the field. I, I do spend quite a bit of time in the field, and so we try to estimate how much time we have left during the day so that we can get back to camp or whatever. I, I saw my boss um, and a colleague of mine reaching out their hand up against the, the setting sun, yep. and I said, what are, you, what are you doing? And then they told me that they were estimating the amount of sunlight left for the day, and I thought, wow, that's yep. really cool. So. Yeah, yep, no, that's a good trick. And so then, then we give them a unit on compass work, um, and um, a lot of people. Uh, there, there's some you know tricks to compasses. People don't realize that it doesn't point towards due north. Yeah. It points along the Earth's magnetic field lines, and so you have to make a correction to you know find true north, and um, that takes a bit of time to to get used to. And also the precision of how well you can use a compass is is also important because. Mm -hmm. In this, in navigation, you have to take into account the possibility of uncertainties. And although you may be moving more or less in a direction, you know, if you're walking on a slope, it may throw you off. And you know, you have to take these things into account. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's the third exercise. And then what we do is we have them put it together, and we have them do a walk from the um, Harvard uh, Church. Um, and a, there's a spire there that's 200 feet tall, and then walk to the Center for Astrophysics, which is about a mile away. And so they have to count their paces and, and the directions that they take um, and go to the roof of the Center for Astrophysics and look back at the steeple and hold out their finger and knowing the height of the steeple, know the distance and use a compass to, to take a bearing to that. So you have this map that you create from the walk you know, just the different distances and paces and angles and stuff. And um, so you have a position from that. And then you have a position from the distance to the steeple and the bearing to the steeple. Um, and you can compare the two. Hmm. And so that's kind of the redundancy between the two. If you think you know you're in a given location, you can start to look for other things that will, um, I guess, add to your, you know, certainty in some sense of where yeah. you are. So so that's kind of a set of four weeks worth of assignments that culminate in what more or less is, is you know, kind of a practical field exercise of navigation. And um, it's, it's remarkable how well they do from this first baseline where they seriously, you know, misjudge their ability to navigate and all of a sudden, you know, by the fourth week they're doing a good job of it. Nice. It actually sounds like a course I'd be really interested in. Well, one thing about our 
way of life today is that we now travel long distances in short in a short amount of time. Um, we can find ourselves on the East Coast and then not too long later on the West Coast or in the Northern Hemisphere to the Southern Hemisphere. So uh, going back to being more detail oriented, we don't even spend enough time learning the surroundings that we spend most of our time in. Mm -hmm. So I can see how we can easily find ourselves lost. Um, well, it's interesting how, um, I mean, I think, I think it's always a fun thing to do when I go to a new surroundings to try to play the game of, of developing that map. Um, yeah. And so That's cool. um, I guess the way there, there's an interesting distinction in um, the way people um, imagine their surroundings. And uh, one is called root knowledge, which is that, you know, a series of paths or roads or something like that and their interconnectivity. Um, on the other hand, our brains are wired up for what's called survey knowledge, which would be as if you were able to uh, be on a magic carpet looking down at your surroundings where you can just see the relationship between all things as opposed to just thinking about you know, traveling in a one-dimensional way like that. Um, and so a lot of times when we're in a new surroundings, um, we tend to fall back on this root knowledge because it just simplifies what we have to learn. But then I guess the challenge I would give to you or somebody you know, trying to learn their way in new surroundings or even in surroundings that are familiar with you is to try a shortcut. Uh, because um, behaviorally, uh, shortcutting is um, an indication that people have survey knowledge. So. Every so often what I'll do is if I'm traveling something familiar, I'll decide to just take a different path. And um, that will, you know, say, well, I, I think if I take this path, I'm going to end up over here, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, and, uh, and the, you know, of course, it's the, the odds that you might get a little lost or things might not quite work out the way you expected, you know, is a bit higher. But it has the reward that you sort of build up this this two dimensional image in your mind of um, what things are like. So I would encourage you to um, do short cutting or take non familiar um, paths, um, even though it might you know be a little bit anxiety producing. But ultimately, you're going to learn more about um, your surroundings. I actually do try to challenge myself in this way um, with a lot of yeah. hiking I that I do. I have a, I, oh, I have an interesting challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, so a, uh, let me tell you, well, it's not, okay. um, well, they're, they're, I, I've just had two thoughts. So one, one is something that's hap gonna happen to me and another one is, is another trick, which you probably know already because you're, if you're a field biologist and you spend a lot of time hiking, then you probably know this. But um, um, I was on a radio program and caller came in and said, um, Oh, I went went out. Jo I went to the Moscow, and he was in his hotel, and he went out jogging. And pretty soon, he got lost. And how could he keep that from happening? And, and I said, Well, <laughs> whenever you get to, to a turn or a fork in the road, turn around and look at what it looks like. So when you're coming back, you know what it looks yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's 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 a really uh -huh. good trick. And I don't know why people don't. I guess. You're... I don't know why either, because I know a lot of long distance backpackers that just seem to never look back. They just race through nature seemingly without making any observations. I've even heard of yeah. some hikers getting up the next morning and head off in the wrong direction. <laughs> I mean, it's like, wow. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's just part of the, for me, kind of one of the aesthetics of being outdoors is you know, paying attention to these things. I mean, you know, there are the clouds. What are the clouds telling you? Which way is the wind blowing? Which way is the surface wind blowing? Which way is the wind blowing aloft? Where is the sun coming up? You know, where are the shadows? Blah, 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 blah. I mean, all that stuff just kind of adds to my enjoyment. And uh, um, I don't know. It's 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 <laughs> it's part of it. So the challenge that I have coming up is um, uh -huh. I'm giving a talk. Um, one of the interesting things is that this navigation writ broadly is also um, kind of a metaphor for how people lead their lives. And I've gotten more and more interested in how concepts of space um, get mani uh, manifested in kind of psychological, cultural, and, and um, social concepts. Um, so, okay. so, for example, physical proximity is a substitute for intimacy. So we say, you know, um, oh, they're really close or they broke apart or something like that. 
um, or or height is a um, an indicator of power uh, within um, a hierarchy. And there you go. I can't even you know talk for more than a few sentences without using uh, place indicators as as a you know social substitute. So I'm giving a talk about this at a cultural um, conference slash symposium in Weimar, Germany. And the people who are organizing the conference said, will you be willing to be interviewed by a TV crew from Germany? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, we'd like to take you into these woods in Weimar. Yeah. So so it's like, okay, I've never been to Weimar before. <laughs> They're going to take me into some woods. So it's Spin you, you know, around. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what they're going to do to me, but, you know, they're going to try their best to get me lost, I'm sure. So I have to figure out how to, you know, how to deal with this in some way. Well, that sounds like it's going to be interesting. <laughs> I was just remembering something, too. Yep. Um, I, I hate earbuds. I just don't like them. I don't like the idea of tuning out my world, no matter where I am. And as a backpacker, I thought that other backpackers would feel the same. But really, I've noticed most of the time when there's a backpacker hiking alone in the backcountry, they are almost always wearing earbuds. And, and I just, I don't, I don't get it. Uh, what are you out there for? So, yeah. and really the first time that I've experienced noticing this in a startling way was, I mean, I've, I've been, I'm young enough to have had earbuds probably all my childhood, but I just, I've never really been into them. But I remember um, in college watching people cross this busy highway near the university mm -hmm. with earbuds. And it just yep. seems so odd to me because I wouldn't want to cross such a busy highway without being able to hear, without being able to hear traffic. And, and this particular highway is, is known for a lot of accidents. A lot of deaths have occurred there. Yeah, yeah, no, I, it, it bothers me a lot all the time. I mean, I can't, you know, tell them to not do it, but I mean, uh, but, uh, you know, you're walking around and, you know, somebody is staring at their cell phone and, and, and you know, walking somewhat erratically and they have the earbuds in so they can't hear you coming. And um, I do, I, I run also, and so I see people running with earbuds in and wouldn't you want to know if a car is approaching or yeah. I bike in and out of work? And, um, so, you know, I have to pass somebody and so there's a, I have a little bell. I mean, this is you know, kind of bicycle, bicycle commuter culture, but you know, you have yeah, a little bell yeah. to warn people that you're coming. And then as you're, if you're going to go around them, I typically say, you know, on your left, which is just means I'll pass you on your left, that kind of stuff. But, you know, they, they are kind of erratic mm -hmm. and they have the earbuds in, they can't hear you. Sometimes you go by and you can, it's so loud that you can actually hear what their earbuds are playing. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 uh, and I think it's just, it's really important to, you know, I mean, use all of your, you know, senses, uh, you know, yeah. to, to be yeah. alert to what's going on. And, and so this is this kind of tune out of, of, you know, well, you got rid of your eyes because your eyes are now glued to the cell phone and you got rid of your ears because you have earbuds in and, you know, and then you're probably absorbed in what's going on there at, and, you know, inside your cell phone. And, you know, you really kind of stripped away just about any sense that would protect you from, you yeah. know, a car running you over or something like that. Um, so. Well, to finish up here, would you have any more advice you would like to give to our listeners today? Uh, don't forget, don't forget weather, um, because weather evolves both spatially and temporally. And um, mm -hmm. uh, there's an awful lot of science in the weather, which can be rather sophisticated, including um, kind of the, the the problems of predictability. Um, turns out that the weather systems there, there are all these feedbacks that are going on. And so, um, you know, isolated thunderstorms can be quite unpredictable. And so one of the one of the things that I'm fond of telling the students is that um, here's one place where you can do better than computers. I mean, we do think of computers as being kind of this this omnipotent source of knowledge. Uh, yeah. uh, but because um, we just we just grown accustomed to that. But um, weather systems in particular kind of destroy that mythology because although, you know, you can do forecasts based on numerical models and this sort of stuff, 
um, they aren't good enough to capture what's happening on the short distance scale of you as a viewer. And you can see things evolving that happened before your very eyes that the computers can't possibly um, compute. And so yeah. I would say if, if your viewers have kind of done all the other stuff that we've talked about up till now, right? So they memorize the positions of stars in the sky, they remember to look back at the fork of the trail, count their paces and measure the height of something or the you know time before the setting sun using your hand and all these other things we talked about. I would say, okay, add weather to your challenge. And, uh, and I'm not trying to advertise, I have an online course on how to read the weather. Yeah. Um, and um, I put <laughs> well, that together. I'll be happy to promote it for you. Okay, so it's called Backyard Meteorology is the name of the course. And oh, um, nice. you can, uh, unfortunately, I think they may change it back to this. Unfortunately, there are two ways of doing it. One is free and one is you pay a fee to earn a certificate. And I want them to just do the whole thing for free. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but, and they may get back to doing that. But auditing it there's still you still learn a lot in the process of doing that and and if you don't want to you know take that course there's a, there's a lot of ways of doing it all these aphorisms back in the day like uh, red sky at night sailors delight mm -hmm. or um, mackerel scales and mares tails make lofty ships carry low sails and all these things which you cover in your book all those things right right so that's that's also kind of something where it's not just a snapshot in time, but you really have to just see weather evolving, you know, over some length of time, and you start to develop a really good intuition for it. Yeah. And so, um, so I would throw that into to the mix in addition to other things we've been talking about. Very cool. Thank you very much. I have a standard question I like to ask all of my guests. Um, okay. Could you possibly share a story about a special connection or experience you have made in nature? Okay, so so there there are two strange, almost transcendent um, moments, and um, they're both acoustic moments, um, which gives a good reason to take the earbuds out, I suppose. <laughs> but um, they, and they, they they they're actually quite similar in in a lot of ways. Um, so I was cross country skiing. This was many years ago when I was a graduate student. Cross country skiing and. The Sierras, and um, it was a groomed trail, but there's this, you know, they call it Sierra slush for a good reason, mm. because it gets warm, the snow gets warm during the day, and then at night it freezes really hard. And so we were skiing around just around sunset, um, and um, the the um, trails were like porcelain, like, like a toilet bowl or something like that. So, you know, you had almost no grip yeah, whatsoever. Yeah. And so, so my friend and I, we went down this hill, crashed at the bottom, uh, but then the strangest sound happened. So this was near um, Truckee, Nevada, and um, um, there's a big pass there, and there's a, a railroad, railroad yard there with a lot of um, switches and that sort of stuff. And a, um, a freight train was going through there, and typically, you know, when you're turning corners and this sort of stuff, the um, the steel wheels scrape against the steel rails and they make kind of a squeaking noise. But what happened was the acoustics were such that um, the sound as it found its way up the valley and into the mountains started to echo. And, and it was like what would have been sort of a kind of a screeching, nasty sound. It turned, it sounded like the angels singing. I mean, it was just like, like like the heavens opened up and you know the, you get the strange eerie voices that are kind of swimming oh, around. Oh wow, and, and very neat. That, that was amazing, and then it was um, kind of a sim. It was a, not surprisingly, I suppose, a similar um, area in terms of the acoustics. We were camping near a spring. This is in South. East Washington, where things get relatively dry, and we were camping near a spring, which was fairly high up, and there was a whole sort of deep valley down below. Um, so, so it was kind of a very similar structure. And there is a group of coyotes who started howling, presumably, at the base of it. And again, it was the same thing where, where it was not just the coyotes, you know, yelping, but, 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 but it was the strange 
echoing that just kept, you know, enveloping me. And again, because with the echoes, you kind of lose the directionality of the sound, yeah, right? Yeah. Because it's bouncing off of everything. It seems like it's just all around you. So that was another moment where, you know, might have been, I don't know, a once I had a coyote sneak up on me and started yelping like a couple <laughs> feet away from my tent, made me jump through the uh. roof. But in this case, you know, I was just sort of surrounded by this, this, this echoes of the coyote yelps. And, and, and again, you know, you sort of forgot what it was and it became this ethereal sounds that just enveloped me. So um, it was really- Wow, um, thank you. Um, that was really beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that today. From hikers to sailors, kayakers to Arctic mushers, Huth reminds us that we are all navigators capable of learning the skills necessary for meandering through our modern world. But in order to acquire these skills, we must abandon the bubble and look towards the wind, stars, and sun to find our own way.